In the other of the four Gospels, Luke's telling of the Jesus story gives a heavy emphasis on Jesus' teachings about wealth and God's concern for the marginalized, the poor, and the forgotten. In a number of his stories, Luke's, Luke juxtaposes the situation of the rich over that of the poor. In Jesus' teachings, we learn that poverty and wealth are indeed spiritual issues. One of these powerful stories is the story we have come to know as the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And now our reading from the Gospel of Luke. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with, that, with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm. A great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that they may that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father, but, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they don't listen, do not listen to Mo Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone raises from the dead. Let's, uh, I want to start this morning on the meditation on this scripture with giving ourselves a, just a brief period, a moment of silence. Of I want to set the stage for that, though. I want us to consider that we just cro crossed over, as near as can tell, a population in the world of 8 billion souls. So let us consider those 8 billion in this moment in real time. Each of those souls in this moment right now, as you sit in the pews, as I stand up here, is living one unique human experience filled with challenges and joys, sufferings, moments of loneliness, struggle, pain, moments of laughter and ecstasy, moments and unfortunately sometimes lifetimes of unspeakable abuse and crippling poverty. Right now, right now, Someone is trekking across the Sonoran Desert to get to the border. Or someone is waking up to the smell of coffee and reading their paper. Or someone is waiting for somebody to come home. Every one of us living souls right now is living a unique story. So let us take and I will time us 30 seconds just to focus on that moment, this lived moment we have right now and that we share with those 8 billion souls.
I suppose we can call that a prayer, a prayer of mindfulness or recognizing we are all connected and sharing this mysterious lived experience. Each one of us, unique, breathing souls, bears a name precious to God. We are somebody. That's why this story told by Jesus and uniquely recorded by Luke gives a name to one of those two characters, Lazarus. He had a name, and it means, I discovered, God has helped. But when we think about that story, we may wonder, what? It doesn't seem that God helped Lazarus. Lazarus sat at the rich man's gate for years and was never noticed, let alone helped. Could it be, I ask, as I pondered that thought, could it be that the rich man's true calling was to be God to that one needy person, or at least a vessel of God's love? Could it be that God's help could only come through the actions of compassion that that one person for whom only the dogs paid attention to? Could it be that that was the one person the rich man was called to be God to? Or an extension of God, I should say. Was the rich man the one divinely appointed individual through whom God was trying to make God's self known? Through divine love, divine care, divine compassion. Is this story perhaps tragic because this rich man failed to hear God's plea to help poor Lazarus as the rich man walked past this impoverished soul day after day after day. To these, I guess we'd call them rhetorical questions, I would answer yes. This is, in fact, I think, the tragedy of the story. Failing to manifest God's love in that particular situation that literally the man passed by day after day after day at the gate. It seems to me when I think of the roots of suffering and sin manifest in poverty and war and cruelty, that it comes down more or less to four categories or words. Ignorance, greed, fear, and indifference. Any one of these four words might be perhaps helpful when looking at this parable, the rich man and Lazarus, and asking the question for us to learn from. Was the rich man ignorant, unaware? Somebody once pointed out, ignore is in the root of ignorance. It's interesting. I don't know if there's a coincidence or a parallel there. It doesn't seem likely that he didn't notice Lazarus, but we could say that he was ignorant in other ways. He was ignorant to what we might say God's wokeness. Now that's a word used, I know, lately to deride a certain perspective, perhaps. But I would choose, I, there's nothing wrong with being awake. It's the opposite of being not awake, being asleep unaware. The parable suggests that the rich man was not woke to compassion, was not woke to feel another pain, what we might call empathy, was not woke to the only currency that God deals in, which is the currency of care for the suffering of others and for the thriving of all creation. We could ask, was the rich man perhaps greedy? If the definition of greed is to have a singular focus on personal monetary gain 
only for serving one's self while others suffer in their poverty, then yes, perhaps the rich man was greedy. He had plenty to share, implied in the story, and sharing, we can assume, wouldn't, on the one hand, made any difference to his lifestyle or security had he done so. So yes, perhaps the man was greedy. Was the rich man fearful? And again, answer is perhaps. This is a parable. We don't get a lot of details into the inner workings of the character. But let's say he was afraid. Was he afraid that that poor, vulnerable flea bag of a man could just as easily be him? Perhaps. Was he afraid that Lazarus, whose name he likely never even bothered to know, might cause him to question assumptions about his own self-made importance, perhaps? Would his theological notions of God's special blessing manifest by his corresponding earthly wealth be called into question, perhaps? Aren't we all afraid when our foundational theologies and foundational economic theories are challenged? Was he afraid of uncomfortable feelings? or the fear of feeling guilt or shame because he was well off while his brother at the gate was not, perhaps. And finally, was he just indifferent? In short, did he just not give a hoot? Did he not bother to think about the matter presented to him each day at the gate? Maybe it just wasn't on his radar. Did he willfully choose not to care? And this may be the worst of moral failures because if nothing else, this attitude negates the very essence of what we are called to do in this life, to care, to love and passionately care for others with the same care we extend to ourselves. The truth is that this little story, like all good parables, is meant to be a mirror to us and perhaps a, a roadmap may be a better way to say. We are the rich man or woman. We are all prone to sins rooted in ignorance, greed, fear, and indifference. But the good news is, and I want to stress this, the good news is every day, like the rich man, we are confronted with a new opportunity to not be that guy. Every day we are, and I don't mean the guy at the gate, I mean the guy that walked past the guy. Every day we are tempted to either look away or explain away the needs that confront us. Yet every day we are given brand new opportunities to renew ourselves. In the case of poverty in our world, we can create, courageously allow ourselves to look straight in the eyes of suffering and feel sorrow, compassion, and guilt, and know that while we cannot make it magically go away, we can do something. And that's all that God really asks. Do something. Hmm? I think. I hope. I don't have the power to make systemic issues disappear overnight. But God does say, do something. Care. Acknowledge. Look that poor person in the eyes, at least, and say good morning. And then dedicate yourselves. Maybe every time somebody, I'm going to come to this in a minute in the sermon, every time somebody comes up to you asking for something, dedicate yourself to at least support those who can address those needs either financially or getting involved yourself. I've been thinking about this story for a few weeks because I knew that I was going to be preaching on it. And because of this parable, was more acutely in my mind when the last week, or a couple of weeks ago actually, I was running to Rose Hours in the morning to pick up some eggs for breakfast. It was about 6.30 in the morning. I would guess that half the folks waiting in the checkout 
that morning were more or less in the Lazarus camp of our homeless or almost homeless sector of our community. And as I was getting close to my car to leave, a man approaches me for money for a bus ticket, to put it in quotes, because I don't know, who knows, but that was what he asked. And suddenly I'm feeling pain and frustration and anger and guilt, and I think you can relate to this. And all the dysfunction and disparities of Spokane came flooding into my soul. Hey man, I just need some money for a bus ticket. No dude, not today, I shamefully replied. I feel the embarrassment and shame personally, and I assume he does too. The whole situation stinks for both of us. At this one moment, my frustration was not so much with the man who asked, but with the situation that put him and me there. In this one moment, like the rich man and Lazarus, I feel the great chasm whereby I can jump in my car, run to the store, grab and pay for a dozen eggs, get back in my car and go home to my private and safe home. That pains me. Comfort shouldn't be painful, but sometimes in contrast to discomfort it is. While for whatever reason the person is compelled to walk up to a complete stranger and ask for money and maybe create some pretense for why he needs the money. He repeatedly faces rejection and pity. No, sorry, dude, not today. He feels degraded and so do I. This is not the world we are meant to live in. Had I been in a different state of mind, I could have helped him with little change or I could have at least wished him a good day or asked him how he was doing otherwise. But not always do I have that energy. It raises the question, why? Why do we live in this world? This is not the world that we are meant to be. An essential question Right? Why does this extreme gulf exist between me and this man? That we need to look at systemic concerns as well as personal choices. We breathe the same air. We have the same basic needs. We are both called into the world by the same God. Why this chasm between us? But before we can authentically ask that question, we must first acknowledge this one fact, or at least I must. I am the rich man. In all likelihood, most of us would say we were to. And even when we do give the dollar to the panhandler, the honest part of me asks, what good did it do? I can say, perhaps cynically, for one brief moment it relieved my guilt, but that's about it. For one dollar, a small transaction takes place. For a dollar, my guilt is softened, and somebody's received a momentary help for what they need. But it doesn't address the long-term question, why does this situation exist in the first place? In my defense, I will say, unlike the rich man, and I'm making an assumption here, it's a parable, we don't know the psychology of these characters, I do feel, I feel guilt, I feel anger, I feel shame, I feel frustration. As followers of Jesus, I think that's maybe an important thing to feel. Being uncomfortable is a part of living by the Spirit. It's important to never stop, I think, feeling upset or unsettled by the brokenness of the world. Such feelings keep us open. Uncomfortable for sure, but open. Not hardened hearts, but broken hearts. And each time poverty confronts us, if we're really listening to our souls, we hear the voice of God saying, don't settle for guilt, but keep caring. Do what you can and then do a little more. The poverty of this world is not okay. 
And though you cannot solve it alone, you can be a part of that solution. The rich, rich man didn't act because he didn't allow himself, I believe, to hear the spirit, to feel the pain, to hear the call. In some ways, the rich man essentially did what I did in the parking lot at Rosar's. Sorry, dude, not today. The story this morning tells us that the rich man, after his life on earth is over, calls out from the grave. Send someone back to warn those not live, living, now living of the consequences of not caring. The reply comes, if they didn't listen to the prophets who warned them, they're not going to listen to believe anyone else, not even someone who comes back from the grave. It amazes me how loud the Bible speaks about injustice and the poverty that it gives birth to. And yet so many in the church forget that this central concern, this, that this is a con central concern of the gospel. 31,000 verses, I'm told, in the Bible. 2,300 speak of money and wealth. And okay, that's, only, that's roughly 8% of the Bible, but still, to me, it seems significant, not ambiguous. We read Amos, I hate I despise your feasts. Let justice flow down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We read Isaiah saying, it's not, it's not the fast I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Or Micah 6, 8, we are well versed in, I'm sure, for its beauty and simplicity. And what is required? It's real simple. Seek justice, love kindness, and walk in humility. I don't get the impression that that parable is to just suggest that the rich man was embodying those qualities seeking justice, loving, kindness, or being humble. If I have anything to share, it would be to remind us that we are all fleeting and momentary wisps of precious, mysteriously significant, cosmic nothingness, yet somethingness. Here today, gone tomorrow. And so, with perspect that perspective in mind, Jesus, who we read of in the Gospels, shares our focus, sharpens our focus in what is vital and important. Not just this story this morning, but in others of Jesus' teachings. The story of self-sufficient man who built bigger barns to store more wealth, only to die the next day. The story of the multiple times Jesus tells at the great banquet feast where all are invited, especially the disenfranchised. The story of the sharing of a few loaves and fishes where thousands are fed through a few loaves and fishes. The story of the poor widow offering a few pennies shared out of her poverty. The parable of the sheep and the goats where we are reminded that Jesus is literally presenting himself to us in the face of poverty and desperate need that we see in front of us. Some of you have maybe read of the recent story of the man named Yvonne Chouinard, Chouinard, might say his last name wrong, the founder of Patagonia Clothing Company, billionaire. At 83 years old, he claims he never wanted to be a billionaire, he didn't care that much, he still drives an old, I don't know, Toyota or something, and he's a very humble man, it sounds like. And he and his family have transferred the ownership of their company stock into irrevocable trust to ensure that all profits, estimated at around $100 million a year, will be used to combat climate change and protect undeveloped lands around the globe. He was quoted as saying something like, if, if I recall, something like, what good is this company if there is no habitable planet for it to exist? 
very existential and sobering and gospel thought. None of us, to my knowledge, are billionaires, and we may think we have little, if any, ability to change the world, but you know that's not gospel. You know that is not true. All of us are called, right? We're all called. It's not about quantity. I know that sounds cliche, but it is about quality, the quality of our souls. Are we paying attention? Are we open to having our hearts broken and changed? Are we courageous to do what we can, when we can, as much as we can, and do it with great joy because we know in serving others, we are living into the call that gives our lives value and meaning. There is no other way to say it. This parable puts me on edge. It makes me uncomfortable while I know I am forgiven and I am saved. I also need to say, we, and I believe we will be held to account to the best degree possible. I would like to know that I did the best I could. And I know I won't be able to clearly say that, but I hope I can say that to some degree. The rich man in the afterlife seems as if he's living in a place of torment. He's tormented because he missed out on what his life is really about. For me, the torment he must have felt was the torment of regret, of not seeing. How did I not notice? How did I miss what was right in front of me? How did I not see what was most important? What opportunities to infuse love and joy and justice into the world did I willfully pass by? These are the kinds of regretful thoughts I want to have as few of as possible I know I have them I know there are many things many things I haven't even noticed many opportunities that I walked by but I'm grateful for those ones I have noticed and for the ones I have done something good for I know we all have those moments We've missed them, opportunities to be compassionate and loving, and yet I will still be infinitely loved by an almighty, loving creator. It's not contingent upon what I do or don't do in order to receive God's love. Yet still God wants me to be that vessel of love into the world, and so will we all hopefully be that, and that we are all loved by God and we are all called by God, and that is the assurance of the gospel. This sermon we began with 30 second silent reflection focusing on our awareness, awareness that we are all, when it comes down to it, interconnected, rich and poor alike. We are all having our own unique struggles and joys. Our stories are private and yet a part of a great interconnected, mysterious collective. The gulf we create by our disparities of wealth is not a gulf intended by God, and it's not one we can settle for. We are all one. The rich man forgot this truth. And we are called, I believe, to remember it. So let us take, let us bracket this moment with another 30 seconds of silence. In those 30 seconds, let us lift up and remember there are people living their moments right now who need love and attention as we do. And also ask God that God will give us the courage and the, the, the renewed spirit to not only recognize our interconnection, but to act out of that knowledge. So let us silently pray for 30 seconds.
Amen.